we are off. It's the final episode of the week here on Stand Up, and I am very happy to have you listening. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to new listeners. Thank you to old listeners. Thank you to any listeners. Can't do it without your support and paid subscription. So if you haven't signed up, what are you waiting for? Let's do it now. StandUpWithPete.com. Those of you who have been supporting for a long time, I love you guys so much. I love doing this show. Can't do it without you. It was so great to see like almost 50 of you at the Hangout last night. The subscriber hangouts are every Thursday night. We went for like two and a half hours, lots of laughs, lots of thoughtful conversation, as always. And I always learn a lot from you. So thank you very much to all those who hang out. Those of you who don't, you're missing out. You don't have to say anything. Keep your camera off. You can keep your mic off. You can just be with us if you want. But you're never alone if you're a part of this community. I hope that you feel that way. And you can always hang out on the Discord platform which a lot of people do as well. If you haven't checked that out, you should. Okay, well, I've got an awesome episode for you today. Christian Finnegan, Ophira Eisenberg, two of my favorite comedians, joining me together, the three of us together for the first time in about a month, I think. And you're going to love that conversation. It was great. As always, they took the piss out of me, as they say, across the pond because of my stupid mustache. And uh, it was fun. And uh, before that, though, I have a great, great, great conversation for the first time with Washington Post columnist, food writer, Tamar Haspel, she's the co-host of a new podcast, which I love. I think they've done four episodes now called Climavores. She co-hosts it with my friend Mike Grunwald, who was on a couple weeks ago talking about it. I just think this was a fascinating conversation. She has just a great style and personality, and she's really fun and very, very smart and has had a a, a really very interesting life. And so I think you're going to love my conversation with Tamar She's got a new book as well. I'll be talking to her about that. It's called To Boldly Grow. I mentioned it here on the show, but we'll be talking about it in depth more really soon. But I think you'll uh, you'll love that. If you love food, and we all do, you want to know where it came from. You want to know about how it's most sustainable, and you want to know about all of the rest. Well, then you're going to love this conversation, and you're going to love everything that she does. So I'm going to shut up, and let's head into it. Here we go with Tamar Haspel. Oh my gosh, I have her here joining me on my podcast to talk about her brand new podcast that she's co-hosting with Mike Grunwald, who we talked to last week. The great Tamar Haspel finally joins me. I am embarrassed that I've never, I don't think, invited you. I don't think, I, I didn't think I was good enough for you. Pete, it just means we have like lots of talking to make up for. Okay, well, I'm very excited to talk to you. I have a billion questions for you. But first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about you and your career and and your evolution here. Where, where did you start? I mean, I think most people are familiar with your column with the Washington Post. Hopefully they'll go get your new book. Hopefully they'll listen to a new podcast. But kind of when did you, how did you get into this space of, 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 of food? It was almost by accident. It was, you know, back in the 90s when I uh, uh, remember when low fat Food was all the rage. And, you know, and the reason it was people now make fun of it. But the reason it was is that there was some really compelling and interesting research coming out of China that indicated that a very low fat diet, less than 10 percent of your calories from fat um, could actually reduce the clogging of your arteries. And, you know, my father, an Ashkenazi Jew, had, you know, arteries that were clogged with pastrami sandwiches he ate when he was 10. <laughs> and he had a heart attack when he was young in his 50s. And so my mother was doing this and she was cooking very low fat, as a lot of people were. But if you're old enough to remember that era, you can you probably also remember that a lot of low fat cooking was and is a little bit joyless. <laughs> and so uh, so we started this newsletter. It was called Dreaded Broccoli, Enjoying the Food You Know You Should Eat. And it was sort of a food enthusiast take on, on low-fat cooking and eating. And it caught the attention of the late legendary Maria Guarnaschelli, who was an editor, uh, a book editor in New York. And she was at Scribner at the time, and she signed us to, to write that book. And which we did. And uh, and that opened all the freelance doors for me. And I became a food writer. And it kind of suited me because, you know, you can put on clothes that are different from for that are the same as the ones you wore yesterday. And you don't have a boss. And so I mean, all I just, the things I suck at, I don't have to do anymore. How ma- you must have a thousand people a day, a year, whatever, writing. You'd be like, how do I have your career? I mean, being a food writer is one of those things that that's like being a professional basketball player only because you can't support yourself writing about food. But maybe you, you know. can. 
No, you can't really. And, <laughs> you know, the reason, well, you used to be able to yeah. back in the day <laughs> for that damn internet. <laughs> um, back in the day, we could, food writers and writers could make a living. And I did make a living for a while there when Condé Nast and, and Time Inc. were playing, paying $3 a word. But then everything got disrupted by the internet and it's changed a lot now. And it is very difficult to make a living as a as a freelance writer. And, you know, I'm fortunate my husband and I both had other careers where we we made a little money. And so, you know, we're OK. And I don't have to worry about keeping a roof over my head or food on the table. If you want to write for a living, the best way to do it is to get a staff job somewhere. That's the advice that you give to all young writers. Yeah. Uh well, good luck, young writers, on that. Good and, luck, young writers. Well, and don't give up on it because we need new yeah. writers. And certainly, <laughs> but just be real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly more journalism, uh, local journalism especially. All right, we can talk about that another time. But let me now give us your credibility and, and, and kind of a lightning round of what you do. Because in reading you and listening to the new podcast, you 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 talk a lot about your experiences growing your own food and that you've done a little bit of seemingly everything, including hunting. And you have all kinds of thoughts and, and strong points of views on, on all of it, raising food, uh, animals ethically uh, for the, for the climate, obviously a new podcast, but like, tell me a little bit about you, you moved from Manhattan to Cape Cod, which is one of my favorite places in, in the world. And you grow everything that you can grow in the soil there, but you also farm oysters and, and hunt deer. I mean, what have you not done? What have you done? I haven't done any cows or sheep because okay. we don't have any grass, so no goats. But okay. we've done just about everything else. And, you know, this this started as a project. It was sort of it was it was more than a lark, but but not much more. We moved from Manhattan and basically by accident to Cape Cod. And we found ourselves here. And I'm like, okay, I write about food. What can I do here that I couldn't do in Manhattan? The answer is all kinds of stuff because, you know, we have a property with a couple of acres and we're, you know, not rural, but definitely not urban anymore. And so there were all kinds of things that we could do. And I started, okay, well, let's see if we can have one food a day that we get firsthand that we, you know, hunt or gather or, grow. And so we have done, we did gardens and then we went, we built a chicken coop and did laying hens. We've grown our own shiitake mushrooms. We forage for mushrooms. We have had turkeys, meat, chickens, ducks. We've raised two rounds of pigs. Um, we fish for serious. We have a boat and we spend a lot of time on it and we actually land most of the fish that we eat during the year in these few months. Um, because you, free, uh, you freeze the fish. Yes. And we've gotten, yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have like a, you have to have a decent vacuum sealer because fish is hard to you go preserve so that it's still good out on the boat on the Atlantic and Cape Cod and you, uh, rod real catch fish. Yes. Do you fish Pete? Yeah. All right. Well, next time you're on Cape Cod, you come and see us and we'll go out and see if we can put you on the fish because I'm going to be there tomorrow, apparently. You are not. No, but I will now. <laughs> oh, okay. You're but not. <laughs> do you think, real quick, as an aside, um, do you agree with the following statement? Roosters are assholes. Oh, totally. Yeah. And uh, chickens are little dinosaurs in general, and roosters are just chickens with testosterone. I call roosters now alitos, but let's not. Let's not oh, yeah, okay. digress. Let's make Let's this not. about politics. Um, so, <laughs> so there's the credibility. She's done almost everything but some of those grazing animals. And I think that, you know, I talked to Mike Grunwald last week, and Mike is, is a journalist and an author and a very opinionated guy, knows a ton about government policy and, and obviously climate and energy policy and so on, and knows everybody. The two of you on this podcast together is a match made in heaven. And I just want you to talk about why someone with your basically your career credentials and everything that you've done would agree to do this podcast. You must obviously really think it's a good idea. And I just cannot talk. I can't speak highly enough about it. I three episodes love each one of them. They're really well done. I've learned a ton and I thought I knew a lot about this stuff. Why would you do this? So. I think that, you know, how our diet affects our climate is one of the most important 
issues in food. And so when Mike came to me and said, hey, I, you know, I've got this podcast in the works looking for a co-host. Um, I think we might be able to do it together. And, you know, we felt we, we sussed that out and it and we seem to work well together. So I was delighted to do it. But I want to talk a little bit about. So, yeah, I do all these things. I grow my own food. I find my own food. I kill my own food. Um, but the, how it, do you do it? How do you kill a deer gun? Well, so we start with poultry because that's the easiest best way i think to to kill a chicken or a turkey is you you have a cone like a traffic cone upside down so narrow end down you put the and it's you know the the tip is chopped off you put the bird in the cone with its head out the bottom Mm -hmm. and you sever the blood vessels so it's one quick cut and that's Mm -hmm. the only pain that there is and then the bird bleeds out so deer you shoot um pigs you also shoot in the uh, and they have a little brain and use a small caliber bullet. Uh, so they're brain dead, but the heart still beats so you can bleed them out. So yeah, I, I'm pretty fucking good at killing things. I, it's like kind of alarming. Do you have, did, did, <laughs> did you grow up? Did you kill anything when you were? A- no, are you kidding? My family, I, I grew up in this middle-class Jewish, you know, household where, you know, they had the New York review of books and, you know, the, the, the whole idea is like, no, no, guns don't kill people. Goyim kill people. <laughs> it's like the attitude that was in the in the Jewish community. That's really and so funny. no. And 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 when we lived in New York, and Kevin, my husband, when I met him, uh, he had uh, uh, a couple of shotguns that he used for trap and skeet, and I didn't even want them in the apartment. Right. I'm like, no guns in the apartment, and he's right. like, honey, without without ammunition they're just tubes <laughs> it's like, that is and eventually a, i i kind of let that happen but if you had told me then i'd be shooting my own deer i i no. wow no. did you have to uh was that hard for you yes it was incredibly hard for and me is it now and yes it is still hard and the day it gets easy is the day i stop doing it oh. because something has gone wrong mm. because i think that taking an animal's life should always be a non-trivial undertaking. And, um, and I always do it as carefully and as mindfully as I possibly can. And one of the most embarrassing moments of my career on live radio, and there will probably happen every day, but I was arguing with a caller about hunting. Even though I grew up in a hunting community, I just never did it myself. And I was kind of like given, you know, taking the piss out of him for killing animals or something. And he's like, let me ask you a question. Do you eat animals? And I was like, yes, a lot. And he goes, and you don't kill them yourself? I go, no. He goes, where do you get them? I go, the grocery store. And he goes, well, then I'm better than you. And <laughs> it was like such a moment of like just defeat. He's like, absolutely right. He kills, he, he eats what he kills. And that is the ethical, that's it. That's all you need to know, right? Yeah. And, and oh, I've had that same versions of that same conversation, you know, people who are meat eaters, but think I'm a monster because I raised my own pig and killed my own pig. Um, and oh, you just I agree don't with do them, that. actually. And then when you when you say it that way, I guess I agree with them. <laughs> I know I, 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 I get that. I understand what 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 people's objection is. But um, and, you know, how I'm willing to to talk about the moral issues connected with meat eating till the cows come home. Oh, but there was a point I, I wanted to make um, somewhere in there. Nah, that's uh, that's and, how we do it. Here. And that is that, you know, we all have our own personal experience with food, which is one of the things that makes us all believe sort of, we know something about food, Yes. but, but the actual, the things that I write about and the things that Mike and I talk about on climavores are, are, are not those visceral things. These are sciencey things. Yep. And in some ways, never the twain shall meet because the stuff that I do myself um, is all about, you know, the satisfaction of getting food myself and also learning about where food comes from. It, it's, it keeps me on the steep part of the learning curve, but then the stuff I write about and the stuff that, that Mike and I talk about is all research all the time. It's yep. all my journalistic and, you know, these things, these two things, sets of experiences do cross over, but mostly they're kind of separate. 
I love that. I mean, I love that they're separate and I love that you're, you're, you're doing the podcast with Mike because of the point you just made about science based, journalist based, journalism based, uh, uh, ideas, solutions, problems that you identify. And, but even within that, you and Mike can disagree as you did probably the most on the episode about eating local, but Mm -hmm. it was one of the, it's one of those disagreements where you're having two super thoughtful, highly intelligent, credible people making good points. And as a listener, you decide to agree with Tamar if you're me, (laughs) but and I mean, I'll, or, or anybody reasonable, really. Yeah, you, of course. Obviously, Gr- <gasps> Grunwald should be a verb of what he's trying to do to you. He's <laughs> Grunwalding. <laughs> so, so, but, but that's that's so important that that you look at it that way. So, let's just talk, if we can, about you know, just just give a quick preview. You have to listen to this episode. Well, all of them. Uh, the three episodes are number one: why eating for the climate is so complicated. Uh, three that are up right now. Number two: bursting the eat local bubble, which blew my mind. It was one of those podcasts where you're walking around your house. That's what I do, and you know where you were and what you were doing when you heard a thing. And that happened several times in that episode, as well as the latest one. It's not the how; it's the cow about America, American beef, and the role it plays mm-hmm. in climate. And so. These are the three episodes that are that are up uh, and you can should subscribe and, and listen every week to Climb of Wars. But the eating local bubble Tamar, I was really enlightened by this for so many reasons. What do you just want to say about uh, any of the kind of myths maybe around eating local that are going to destroy us? So, first of all, I am a huge fan fan of eating local you know here on cape cod there's a farm that i've literally been going to since i was a kid Mm -hmm. and i will go out of my way to buy from the small farmers in my area i am a small farmer i eating local has all kinds of pluses and basically those pluses are okay i think it's it's a vibrant thing to have in your community it keeps money in the local economy Sometimes it's op- it keeps open spaces. There's a place where a kid can go to meet a pig. And, and it's a constant reminder that food has to come from somewhere. But there are a whole bunch of sort of ideas that have morphed into this bigger idea that, you know, these small, local, sometimes organic farms can solve our problems, that they're better for agriculture, that they're better for the climate. And they're, they're, just, they're just not. And and this is the thing about food. It's all trade offs all the time. And every everything you eat has an upside and a downside. And, you know, sometimes one or the other is more obvious, but there's nothing that just solves all the problems. And, you know, local ag is like that. It's just it's not a climate win. It just isn't. That's a math problem. And you do the math and it's not a climate win. You mentioned, I think, in the first episode that some of your, you know, earlier work proved to be wrong. And I think you're referring to, yeah. you know, things about food that science has since proved wrong. I mean, it, you, I think you're a person, a journalist, a writer who relies on the best science. And we've learned a lot from our mutual friend, Aaron Carroll, about how that changes. How much do we know right now, though, about food when it comes to, you know, what's good for you, what's nutritious? Because there's all these different views and thoughts about that, much of which I guess are are kind of counterintuitive. So how good is the science and research now? P, we don't know, Jack. Right. right. (laughs) And and it's like, so, yeah. All right. Let me step back for a second and say my goal as a journalist is to change my mind because I want to know the things I get wrong. And I have a whole list of strategies that I try and do that. Whenever I write about a topic, my first thing is to find the smartest person I can find who disagrees with me because I've been doing this for decades. I have opinions about this stuff and listen. And so, yeah, so I, there's a whole bunch of stuff I've changed my mind about, including low fat diets, which I wrote a whole book about. And but what it what I think I've come to believe after many years in this space, and I know Aaron and I see eye to eye on this, is that surprising as it sounds, we don't have good tools to 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 explore the connection between our diet and health 
And, you know, there are basically two ways to do it. We can amass a huge cohort of people and we can periodically ask them what they eat and then we can see what happens to them. But there are two huge problems with that approach. Number one, the diet, people are terrible at telling researchers what they actually ate. And so the the all the databases are woefully uh, uh, that's uh, inaccurate. Yeah, of course they are. I can't even remember. I mean, yeah, for different reasons, I'm sure. But go ahead. Sorry. So anyway, if you ever question, if you ever doubt that, here's what you do. You go on to the Internet and find yourself what's called a food frequency questionnaire. And hmm. you'll find one that goes with one of the big cohorts out of Boston. And you try and fill that out and tell me how many servings of cabbage you ate in a year. Um, and, and it's like, and it goes, it gets harder from there. But the other problem on the, the big cohorts, one problem is that the data are inaccurate. Yep. Um, but the next is that it, it's hopelessly confounded. So if you look at people who eat a lot of meat, they tend to die earlier than people who don't eat a lot of meat. But when you parse it a little finer, you're like, OK, well, is it the meat or is it something about meat eaters? Because they tend to die more in accidents as well as everything else. So maybe that's an indication that there's lifestyle issues. And people who eat one way are totally different from people who eat another way in ways that we can't always even understand, let alone control for. Well, so I think it's, it's hard probably to study because, nutrition that way. Go ahead. Sorry. I, well, I just think it's probably because people who eat meat take a lot more risks and, and we're tougher and like vegetarians and vegans are like cowards and, and wusses. Right. And they just they stay home with their lentils. <laughs> they, and, they, uh, <laughs> they read. Never do anything risky. Uh, that's, <laughs> well, no, it's yeah. It's such an important point, though, about the statistics and and the studies and human behavior. And, I, you know, you're just mentioning that you just how many people have fallen for these diets and books about uh, the, you know, the, the blue planet diet or whatever, the Mediterranean diet, you'll live longer. People live longer in Asia uh, because of their nutrition or uh, there's so many things and they've all been debunked, haven't they? Well, it's not so much that they've been debunked. It's that all of those diets are perfectly reasonable ways to eat. And so if that's what you enjoy, go ahead and do right. it. But my real beef with them mm. Is that okay? First, let's take as a guiding principle. If the experts disagree wildly, it probably means it doesn't matter very much. And so, so we have this field where we don't really know a lot, but people are making hyper specific recommendations. And what that does is it gives ordinary people this idea that eating healthfully is the province of experts and you need a white coat and an advanced degree to figure it all out. And that's just Bullshit. If you eat a wide variety of wholeish foods in quantities consistent with the weight you want to be, you will be fine. If you don't know Tamar Haspel, you're probably falling in love with her the way I am in terms of the no, way. No, that... no, no. There are lots of people out there who are thinking that's not the word I was thinking. Of. Well, not this audience. The way that you're talking, the way that you're communicating it, it's it's so it's so helpful. I mean, I've always, like I said, loved your column at The Washington Post and knew you're a very respected writer. Uh, but I, uh, I feel like I've lost time and, and, and not talking to you in the past, but here we go. We're making up for it. So okay, we the, the eating, when it comes to, uh, well, actually this was not on the eating local episode, but let me just ask you this right now, because I, again, I knew where I was when I heard this, when we talk about agriculture, when we talk about farming, we talk about actual space, uh, uh acreage used for beef cattle, uh, versus vegetables. You, I feel like you said something like 1%. That's farming what I said. is is so, vegetables is is um plants. Yeah, well, no, is vegetables. Vegetables is different. Sorry. Yeah, it's totally different, and it's that distinction that matters because when we think about okay, how do we eat better and how do we have a better agriculture? Everybody immediately turns to vegetables. Vegetables are on their own plate. Vegetables in nice green rows on on the farm, but the reality is. Vegetables are a rounding error in our all of these conversations because, all right, we have 400 million crop acres in the United States and 1% of them grows vegetables. So you could change vegetables from, you know, it, and make them grown better and have a lower impact um, and it still wouldn't do much for the climate because it's such a small part of agriculture. The action is in the 
you know, charisma free row crops. And and everybody hates row crops because, oh, corn and soy, they're terrible. But the reality is corn and soy as plants are wonderful. As Twinkies, they're not so great. And so, but it's corn, soy, barley, oats, lentils, dry beans, chickpeas. These are whole grains and legumes that we can grow at scale without backbreaking labor, without a lot of waste because they're shelf stable. These are the backbone of a healthy diet for plant, for people and planet. And vegetables are a blip. I'm in favor of vegetables. I eat a lot of vegetables, but they're not the backbone of what we should be talking about. What should we be talking about when it comes to agriculture? I mean, because I, as I think you mentioned before we started, you know, I'm pretty good at finding smart people that are that are good at explaining uh, policy and, and, and research and science, and medicine. Man, I'm confused about the way forward agriculturally. It's so easy for any of us to demonize big uh, corporate farms, obviously consolidation of the family farm and, and it's, you know, capitalism in general. Obviously, that seems to be the problem in terms of we grow things that aren't necessarily efficient and don't feed the, the world. We grow things that make us the most money and we don't have equitable distribution mm-hmm. and so on. OK, I'm done. What do we need to be talking about? So I love when you tick off all the world's problems and say, OK, tomorrow. Well, in terms of agriculture, (laughs) in terms of agriculture, like how do we feed the world in both an ethical way and a responsible uh, to fight climate way? Right. And uh, so. Two things. First, the biggest offender climate wise is beef. And I know that there is a contingent that. Um, you know, it's it's not the cow, it's the how and the how matters. I mean, grazed cattle are different from, you know, feedlot fed yeah. cattle and the, the implications are different. But again, it's not cut and dried that one is always better than the other. And, you know, the question of whether cattle can offer up enough in terms of ecosystem services, sequestered carbon, um, soil health. Uh, decreased wa- water runoff, can that outweigh their carbon footprint? And, you know, I think that from a carbon standpoint, it's clear they can't. So cattle are are always carbon positive in every study that I have seen. But I think that there's still room for cattle in our system. I just think that they need to be deployed more judiciously and Americans and other developed countries have to eat less. So eat less beef. But the other goes back to this whole plants issue. How can we feed the world? Well, we can feed the world on the acreage that we have right now. And that's really key because what we don't want to do is tear down forests or grasslands to make more cropland because that's, that's a real climate offender. So, and we do that with the, the efficient, nutritious, versatile staple crops. So it's grains, it's legumes, it's tubers, potatoes and sweet potatoes, uh, you know, peanuts. Some places it's tree fruits, breadfruits, jackfruit, bananas are staples in, in some places. And it's those things that we can grow a lot of food, nutritious food on, on a small piece of land. That's how we feed the world. One question about oysters. How much you're an oyster farmer in Cape Cod. How much is climate change? Do you think affected uh, oyster farming? It has. It's hard to know to, you know, tease out because there are all kinds of things that affect farming and to pin things back to climate is is difficult. Now, there are places where specifically ocean acidification is is a problem. And that's that started on the West Coast. And I think we're beginning to see it, especially in hatcheries here on on the East Coast. Um, And anything that changes the quality of the water changes the way people farm. And, you know, our oysters go in the water and, you know, just full disclosure, we've stepped back from the day to day running of the farm, but we did it for 10 years. We live and die by the conditions in the water. And we grow in a place that my husband calls the Napa Valley of Oysters because we have a big tide, which means lots of nutrients flushing into the harbor twice a day. And we have the right degree of salinity. They're not too salty. And it's just a primo place. But as conditions change, the food changes, the temperature changes, the salinity changes. 
and you have to adapt. That's right. You have to adapt is what I hear every farmer saying now that are growing things in in, in regions that you couldn't maybe a a while ago, Mm -hmm. but that if you're planning for the future, it might not be a terrible idea to put a peach tree in Syracuse, New York, as my friend Kevin is doing. Uh, So, all right, I'll let you go. But before I do, I'm hoping that you will come back uh, as often as I can. And I'm definitely going to go fishing with you. I promise you that. But you have a new book out, came out in March. And I just want you to to preview that. And then when I'm done reading it, I hope that we can talk about it. To Boldly Grow, Finding Joy, Adventure, and Dinner in Your Own Backyard. It looks great. I can't wait to get it. Talk to me. I will be delighted to come back and talk at length, but the 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 executive summary is basically that it's the story of uh, my husband and me trying the next thing over and over and over. First, it was the garden. Then we built the hoop house. Then we built the chicken coop. Then we got the turkeys. Then we started mushroom foraging and, and then, and then, and then. And, you know, the project started to be about food, but what it ended up, being about was was skill acquisition, yeah. solving new problems, yeah. staying on the steep part of the learning curve. And, you know, I can work from now till kingdom come on being a better writer. And still, every time I read like Robert Graves, I'm like, yeah, I should be bagging groceries. <laughs> and, but but you never learn as much as you do when you try something you've never yes. tried before. Yes. That increment from zero to one is where like the action is. It's where the satisfaction is. And, and so solving new problems and, and these are things that aging brains, which we all have one thrive on solving new problems makes you strong. It makes you confident. It makes you capable. Um, and it also, you know, when it's food related, it gets you at dinner. Uh, it's so great. I love it. And I completely relate to it as I've learned to grow and uh, plants and in, in my gardens my raspberry patches and my little tiny space of land here in, in the suburbs of New York City. And I can't wait to uh, be in the stage of my life where I think you're in, where I can have a nicer, you know, two acres somewhere or more and and experiment more. Because what you're saying, and I know this is what the book is a little bit about, is that how that also affects you. And, and we need this now more than ever uh, to be mindful and be in the garden and doing things that have that steep learning curve. And Man, I mean, I'm I'm satisfied when I learn new ways to string up my tomatoes, which seems like every year I, I try a different way to, uh, to 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 do that. And it's do you hard. do those little hydroponic clips? No, no, I just no, been, okay. These are the best. <laughs> I, I you know my porn now is Gardener YouTube, and they're like my celebrities. I'm like, oh, I really hope I get to meet Gary Pilcharek, who I don't know, he's like a YouTube guy, just. I, I love to watch people and they all have these great ideas that they share about, yeah. you know, all of it. So it's great. It's so satisfying and purpose driven. You can learn anything on YouTube. That's for sure. Tamar, I really appreciate you. You are one of the best, if not the best at what you do. So to, to the fact that you're now also doing the podcast, we're, we're all better for it. And uh, unfortunately, you have to deal with Mike Runwald, but he's, you know, he's got his moments. I, I'm learning strategies to keep him in check. <laughs> you're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Well, there she goes, Tamar Haspel. For the first time on Stand Up, what did you think? Boy, I really liked that conversation. Learned so much from her and the podcast and her Washington Post column and her new book, To Boldly Grow, which I'm going to be reading and interviewing her about very soon. Check her out at TamarHaspel.com. And of course, check out the new podcast, Climavores, that she's co-hosting with Mike Grun- Grunwald, who I talked about a couple of, talked with a couple weeks ago, so I've talked to them both now, and I'll be listening to that podcast. I hope you will be too, and I'll be definitely be having them both on again as well. Oh, that was so great. Tomorrow has to All right, coming up, my conversation with Christian Finnegan and Ophira Eisenberg. But first, I want to tell you about Indeed.com. Let me ask you, what is one of the greatest feelings as an entrepreneur? How about when you start to build a team with people who care just as much about the dream as you do, and they have the skills to make it happen? If you want to find those people faster, you need to get Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. 
find great talent faster through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match assessments and virtual interviews. And with Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data. One of the things I love about Indeed is that several listeners have told me that they've used it to hire great people at their companies, at their firms. It makes hiring all in one place so easy. No other job site takes care of you like Indeed, because with Indeed, you only have to pay if an applicant meets your must-have requirements. Indeed puts you in control of what you pay. You set your must-have job requirements only pay for the applications that meet them. There's a transparent flat fee per application. You get to pause your job posting whenever you want. And when you sponsor an Indeed post, you're four and a half times more likely to get a hire according to Indeed data worldwide. And Indeed doing something no other job site has done. Now with Indeed, businesses only pay for quality applications matching the sponsored job description. Visit Indeed.com slash stand up to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash stand up. Indeed.com slash stand up. Terms and conditions apply. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Oh, and by the way, the minute I've been talking to you, 16 hires were made on Indeed, according to Indeed Data Worldwide. All right, now it's time for the last conversation of the week, as it often is. My Two of my favorite comedians and very good friends, Christian Finnegan and Ophira Eisenberg, join me right now. We will all three be together this coming Wednesday, July 13th, in Venter City, New Jersey. That's southern New Jersey. You can get tickets for that show in the show notes or any of our Twitter, Facebook. Just contact me if you want to come and uh, I'll hook you up. And so looking forward to that and obviously looking forward to this. Both these guys are hilarious comedians, brilliant people, great friends on Twitter at uh, Ophira E and Christ Finnegan, as well as everywhere else. ChristianFinnegan.com, OphiraEisenberg.com. Check out their new specials and everything that they're doing and check out this conversation I had with them right now. Oh, and it just starts with them laughing at the jokes they were making about my new, stupid, very temporary mustache. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're saying what well, now, my He's kind of laughing. Uh, no, I, so I have uh, I have shaved my beard off for some bizarre reason. I lost a bet, and uh, I just have a mustache, and I can't wait to get the beard back in. But what do you both want to say about me? How I appear? <laughs> Be honest. I just said that you should do a lot of auditioning this week because I know that there's a lot of roles for perps. Uh, I think you can Pedophiles. get in some good self tapes right now. You also kind of look like a, uh, you look like, uh, the good cop who's really a bad cop. For sure. <laughs> you know oh, what I mean? you think it's a good cop, but then it turns <laughs> yeah. out to be the bad cop. I got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't you think? White yeah. Especially and with bald the with a thick brown mustache. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had said that you look like an Australian nature guide. Yes. <laughs> that you have a... Sort but of a, you got to do the act out. This is a wallaby. <laughs> <laughs> Crikey, God's creatures. <laughs> I just want to move my mouth to your voice. <laughs> it is a wallaby. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> well, you two, I, you've good. been missed. I missed you. I've missed you. We got together. Here we are. We're together. It's post- Fourth of July, both of you had uh, plenty to say about that time of year. Ophira, you you said uh, you think that America, <laughs> this country has long COVID, is what you said <laughs> on Twitter. I think is, that is what I said. And then, uh, and I was I was waiting for people to get back to me and be like, you know, I I understand long COVID is a real thing for some people, and I didn't want to. I did. I was just waiting for someone to write back, either something. Pro America, something about like how dare you make fun of long COVID? I know, I, I'm shocked no one did. Yeah, it's it's the bonuses, Christian, because they weren't reading. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't Good see part. it. Well, Christian yeah. uh, upgraded you, your kind. Oh yes, he did, and he had p potentially one of the most viral uh, tweets of 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 his uh, Twitter career. Is it rank? <laughs> July Fourth this year feels like attending a birthday party. For someone in hospice. You really went for it. I went for it, baby. You're and right, uh, uh, I, my dad 
uh, his friend read it in the Lowell newspaper. Oh, the Lo- I, apparently it got aggregated into uh, my dad's local paper in Lowell, Massachusetts. So your dad get a, and a did, yeah, yeah, a giggle mm-hmm. out of that. Did he like it? Uh, I mean, I think he's just happy that I have a credit for the first time in five years. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, now, yeah, what, what it, it got it got wrong? aggregated. Uh, that do you know who that dude uh, conceptual James is? No, he's one of the biggest pieces of shit on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I think his name is James <laughs> Lindsay. He's sort of like a like a bargain, like a uh, dollar store Charlie Kirk, or uh, you know a. Jack Prasobiak, just one of those aspiring right wing Twitter douchebags. And he retweeted it. And so I got a lot of uh, I got a lot of responses from very smart people with a lot of. Hair. Oh, that's how it that's how it went into the wrong hands. Uh, yes. I mean, it always will uh, eventually. Sure. And, you know, and like you we were talking about the sort of sanctimonious. My wife, I didn't put it on Facebook just because I don't give a shit about Facebook. But my wife put it on Facebook. And of course, I got like some. I got like five messages from some lady being like, how dare you insult hospice? It's like, I'm not, I'm not insulting hospice, whatever, you know, and just it, all this crap. Like, can we chat? Like she must, she must have written me five times. Oh. Like, Oh, and you're not going to respond to me. And I just right. went back to this lady. I was like, oh my lady, God, I don't fucking like, I don't know you. Like who, yeah. like you think you're the only person to encounter mortality in your life. And like complete strangers are supposed to just tiptoe around your grief. Like, like the, the, the sort of, how ready everyone is to not even be offended, but to take on the mantle of being offended just as a way to sort of achieve some sort of moral high ground on a complete stranger yeah. for no reason at any given time. That's why I'm saying I'm shocked. But my no mom, my mom didn't know. You, my Ophira. mom didn't know that when she reached out to you, she was genuinely offended by it. To be fair, <laughs> she's not that. She doesn't overthink things well, like that. She can fuck entirely you, off. <laughs> you know, it's funny though because I even had with the thing where someone is in Facebook uh, talking to you, talking to you, and then. I mean, they're not talking to you. They're just writing you all of their garbage. Mm. And then when you don't entertain the garbage that is hateful towards you, they're like, and nothing. And st- yeah. you're not even going <laughs> to. Yeah. You're like, what? Like, and I even had that with someone trying to be nice. Some guy reached out to me on Facebook. He was like, you know, I don't see a lot of uh, female comics. And he was paying compliments. Mm. And then there was a thing about him. And then there was another thing about him. And there was another thing about like, since, since I watch you, I also watch this person. You know, I'm just like, okay, fine. Like, you're just having a conversation with yourself. And then there was a thing about like, oh, great. Not even, not even going to say anything. I compliment you and not even going to say anything. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, my God, what I did, is going on? I do a thing sometimes, at least it happens on Twitter, where some person has an anonymous Twitter handle and they really just won't leave you or an argument or a conversation alone. And they're really not making good points or arguing in good faith. I do this. I've done this several times. You might know, like have heard me talk about it, but I, I did it the other day where I just like tweet them. I'm like, call me. Like, say all these ah. things. and I'd love to talk to you. I, I will tape it. And it'll be entertaining for people. But, but you know, if you uh, just be a real person and, and call me because I don't want I don't like this. I don't like this argument. If you really want to, I'll, I'll, I'll argue with you. And I, it, I find it uh, uh, entertaining. But they never do. They almost never call. No, no, no. That's they never call. They never write. They, they never, never write. call. They always write. <laughs> I just I'm lonely. And I just want this person who I'm arguing with on Twitter to call me. Pete just sees those content dollar signs in his eyes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Content, baby. Conflict. Content. Conflict, Conflict creates for a, someone. Ratings. If it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. You know, and I've mentioned this before in terms of content, you know, how many stand-ups are posting crowd work videos mm-hmm. on their Instagram, which I'm not saying is bad, or and TikTok. Just I am. Post whatever you have to. But, and I worry that it sets up uh, an expectation when audiences that are not familiar with coming to comedy clubs in the past come to a show that they're like, oh, this is what it is because mm. they don't have any frame of reference. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I was told at one of the clubs I was working on the weekend that a, you know, bachelorette part, I, actually, sorry, it was like a 24th birthday party, not even a significant birthday, may I point out. <laughs> they all stormed out like before the end of the headliner because they said uh, we expected this to be more interactive. As a matter of fact, we sent an email beforehand saying that we wanted to be par- like be part of the show. It's like, good for you. Since, since when does stand up work like that? I sent wow. an email to the Yankees demanding that I play right field, <laughs> and they did not respond to me. <laughs> 
But I, w- I was like, that is some ballsy stuff right there. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It could be an interesting development. Tell me who books that. I, it's exactly what I want to do. It's all I've got. <laughs> that's all I have. Uh, well, and to, to me, I mean, you know, I understand like, you know, I loved Todd Berry's crowd work special because he's a very specific brand of crowd yeah, work. And, yeah. and but to me, the, the fun thing about crowd work when it's done well is that it's. Yes ephemeral do you know what i mean that that it's this thing yes. that happens in the moment and that you have it has to be it's all context based you know just just seeing like oh some random person called me dumb and i responded by saying you're dumb like like i don't i don't know it just doesn't it doesn't travel well agreed 100 percent. my crowd work yeah, travels really well i just use the same bit on the big guy or an old guy it yes, travels really you just well lead them into a rhetorical cul-de-sac yeah, where yeah. you know what they're going to say and then you have your ready-made retort to come that's my that's how I do new crowd work. special rhetorical cul-de-sac will be dropping <laughs> within months <laughs> But honestly, though, that's why so much of these sort of uh, debate me types on Twitter, the sort of the Charlie Kirks, the Ben Shapiro's, the all these people like that's why I feel like I see through them so clearly, because what they're doing is essentially crowd work, you know, which is that, you know, I'm sure Ophira, you have yours, Pete, you have yours, whatever. It's like I have certain questions that I can ask someone that will trigger a few yeah. Between two and three responses. Oh, yeah. And I have retorts to those responses. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, I lead you into where I'm trying to get you into my kill zone. Uh, and then I drop my hilarious, quote unquote, improv joke. Uh, you know, and that's the way all those all those dudes are. Yeah, I like using crowd work to lead into a bit sometimes just to kind of like switch the energy up too. I sure. mean, I do that. Yes. I do that a lot too when I feel like I have to win over a crowd way harder. I like using crowd work yeah. to replace written material that I've <laughs> thought about and <laughs> crafted and worked hard on. Speaking of which, we've got another gig on the books. That's right, everybody. Ow. It's this <laughs> Wednesday, the 13th. Of July, Soul Joel's Comedy Club in Ventnor City, New Jersey. Come on out, mm-hmm. everybody. First 40 guests are going to get uh, crowd worked to death. I believe this is another one of those movie theaters. It is a movie theater. It's a movie theater that does comedy on Wednesday nights. Wednesday, yeah. Southern New big, Jersey. Big comedy movie night. Uh, so that'll be fun. We'll do, uh, we'll do, we'll do one more together, get the band back together and uh, do a win. You know, you can do a uh, weeknight gigs in like kind of beachy town during the summer and, and get that good crowds. So come on out. If anybody's in uh, Southern New Jersey or what is it? Pennsylvania? Ventnor. Ventnor city. Uh, yeah. I know Ventnor only as a, uh, monopoly property. Oh, oh cool. yeah. is it, a, it's a yellow one. I believe it is. I believe it is the yellow one. Oh, yellow ones yeah. are quality. Yeah, that is quality. It's like just, at least three hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. wondering if and, and and people land on them. It's not like a and boardwalk shit eggs. where you put all your money in the boardwalk and nobody ever lands on it. So typical. That is like so New York real estate in like yeah. a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, let me ask you about how uh, your your Independence Day was. You also had a, a Canadian Independence Day. We don't really need to talk about that. It's not Independence Day. It is a. It's called Confed. It's based on joining, not leaving. Oh. Uh, uh, who joined? Upper Canada and Lower Canada joined to become Canada, which is base- basically what we kind of know as Quebec and Ontario. Oh, it's called uh, Joining Day? Well, it's based on uh, confeder- oh. what we call Confederation, which is joining. Yeah, but that, mm. that's what you're celebrating. You're joining the forming of Canada. Oh, okay. And what are the it's traditional, uh, is there any traditional celebration there? Do you guys... Uh, Same thing, barbecue, you know, hockey, hanging bullshit. out. There's no yeah. hockey. No. <laughs> it's fireworks. <laughs> you sure? And, no? Okay. July. I mean, someone's playing hockey. You're right. Someone is playing hockey. Someone's playing hockey. Street hockey. <laughs> <laughs> and there would always be, I don't know why, maybe this was just the circle I ran in, but someone would take like a cake, a square cake, uh, ice it up, and then make the Canadian flag with strawberries ooh, on top ooh, of it. Oh, that sounds Some good. Bands and a maple leaf in the middle. I yeah. love nice. your, that flag. That's, I, a, that's a nice thing about having a two-color flag. Makes it much easier. Oh, to yeah. Sort of <laughs> two-color flag. I like that. Uh, I love that maple leaf flag. I used to have a, a Canadian. I just love the hat. I love the logo. It's uh, it's very, uh, it's not It's not very divisive, The a leaf. <laughs> you know, it's just a fucking leaf. I love it. 
I think uh, it's, Jeremy Hotz, uh, Jeremy Hotz, a comic <laughs> out of Canada, but also lives in the States uh, and does great. But he had a whole huge bit about how anyone that looks at the Canadian flag is just like, and it was like, what are we going to do? Like that leaf is going to go on your face and make you not able to see. <laughs> like it's such a, uh, yeah, it's not very benign. I like yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't benign. strike fear in the heart. <laughs> uh, do, is it weird that I watched a video of, of uh, fireworks gone wrong video where, oh my God. where they just started uh, launching straight at the group of people that were sitting there, including like there was a, a toddler. I've seen one, it. You saw it as a toddler in one of those play, you know, standing gyms that are outside. And it's just one of those little uh, toy things that they stand in. Those little rolly little circles that you put the toddler in that they wheel around in. And so the woman, one woman runs, like they just start firing, fireworks just start firing right at everybody, including this little kid. And some woman runs and grabs, and it gets really um, crazy, really wild video. It's probably been seen by a lot of folks, and I must have watched it 400 times. I think I spent two hours just watching it over and wow. over. Wow. I. It's a good one. It's a good one. Why do I take so much joy? I, I take joy in a weird fireworks accent. I hate the people that do them themselves. I don't hate them, but I, I think it's a crazy thing to do. Oh, yeah. You know, the roof near us, because we went on the roof to try to see if we could see the Macy's one or maybe some of the other ones around. And they're kind of far away. But someone across the street from me in Brooklyn had like quality fireworks yeah. that they were launching yeah. off of their roof. I was wow. like, what? Who? Where? I mean, just the whole thing. It was a good show. But I do remember when Macy's finished and they all kind of finished at the same time all around. Like I could see New Jersey, I think a little bit. And maybe there was something at a park I could see. Uh, but they all finished at the same time. And then I was like, oh, there's more. And it was like, no, no, no. Those are now just sirens because immediately following fireworks, what do you hear? Ambulances. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, the, uh, there was so many the sirens. Finger de- <laughs> the finger detachment crews are uh, headed oh, all over God, the city. Just like a bottle <gasps> rocket in the, uh, uh, oh, in the eye. God. I mean, in a fa- like what a horrible way to be injured. Oh, how'd you lose your finger or your eye? Well, there was that dude on the New York Giants, uh, Jason Pierre-Paul, I think is who was uh, a defensive lineman or linebacker or something for the Giants who blew two of his fingers off Mm. on 4th of July and basically sabotaged the rest of his professional career. Really? You need... Hope hope it was worth it, buddy. Oh, my God. Yeah, he played for a while with a giant cast over, like, his weird malformed hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for 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 a while, but I think he, he he did get back into the NFL, but I don't think he lasted long because you know you're down you're down two fingers. It's hard, yeah, it's hard. Right? To get, he, they couldn't give him like a hook because that would be yeah, a, it's hard to grab on an people, unfair yeah. advantage mm-hmm. to tackle. That ah, he no, fucking yeah. got me with his, <laughs> his weird hook. <laughs> So the, here's the other thing. But people, I like that it's an advantage. <laughs> people, it is. It's a it's a metal hook. You know, I mean. Uh, I, I like that. Uh, well, I don't like this, but people are now debating the the, the way they feel when they see Ameri- the American flag. I mean, it's always been controversial, I suppose, for certain people more than others. But I mean, now it's like progressive minded people see it as a Trump thing or as a yeah. bad thing. And and I think so much of that has to do with the month of June's Supreme Court decisions what do you guys think about the conversation about, you know, America circling the drain, which we could talk about forever. But this year, it just seems in this Independence Day, a lot of people are just talking about America differently, especially that women have maybe fewer rights than their grandmothers did. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the whole flag as being a conservative signifier has been around longer than right. than our current debacle i mean you know i remember george w but i mean that's always been the thing of you yeah. know i'm proud to be an american lee greenwood bullshit and yeah there and then of course among liberals there's always been that schism the way there always is of kind of like no we should reclaim the flag as you know we're americans too as opposed to fuck the flag you know let's turn it upside down and go all rage against the machine about it um, you know, I, I am on record on my, my album. I believe it was uh six percent joking that I, or maybe it was, no, it was maybe sure you work. I don't know. I, I am not a fan of the American flag aesthetically. I think it's an ugly piece of uh, stitching. Yep. Uh, I think stars and stripes on the same flag is too busy. Um, but Plus, I, you know, horizontal stripes, you know, let's just say that flag, that flag not is flattering. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Packing on a few America. Yep. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, <laughs> you think that makes the flag, the flag look fatter? <laughs> yeah, it makes, makes the flag, flag look is a, fat. Yeah, well, that is one arrogant. I am never, flag. ever going to think of the flag the same way now after <laughs> after that. Think of how much more aesthetically pleasing, it, how, how much just trimmer it would look if there were vertical stripes. If there, can we do, uh, I mean, just be super obnoxious and just go for it. I mean, let's just say, let's just say the flag was associated with leftist, sort of a leftist bent. Let's just mm. assume that. Do you think the right would, uh, I mean, it's not the Confederate flag, maybe is that in some terrible way, but do you think the right would be like, well, here's our version. They have their version. Well, I mean, what do you think the like, Blue Lives Matter? They have <laughs> like like 10, is? I mean, yeah, that's oh, the problem. It's like the, the, the flag is a right wing symbol, and yet they still come up with their own versions because it's <laughs> not my own version. enough for them. I right. want my own version. It's not. Yeah, yeah. They, they, got the, they got the Confederate flag. They got the Blue Lives Matter flag. They've got, you know, Don't tread Trump on me. riding a unicorn, whatever. So what yeah, would ours be? Would it just be a white woman with a, a thought bubble that says, I'm woke or something like that? Would it be yeah. that? <laughs> it, it'd be probably be like avocado toast. I think our, no, I think our flag, I think the progressive flag is the rainbow flag because the rainbow flag is obviously an LGBT you know, signifier. But I think more than it, it's becoming to some extent, it's like I mean, everybody, everybody's in. We want a well, pluralistic I, yeah, society. Yeah, but I think LGBT people would be like, hey, can you not take our stuff? No, yeah, exactly. Maybe, uh, can you not appropriate our voice? <laughs> well, I'll please. tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll LGBT, really about all LGBT li- <laughs> listeners, just calm down. It means let, let us have it all. It's uh, we thank you for what it meant has meant, and now we're going to uh, co-opt <laughs> now it. Now we're taking it, represent just like we've done <laughs> just, in the past. Yeah, exactly. Just everything, just everybody, everybody else, everybody else <laughs> needs a flag that is somehow <laughs> representative of the fact that we're okay with everybody else being different. Well, and, and for so many people on the left, and I consider myself one of them, the whole notion of a flag period is not something that sits so super comfortably with me because I think one of the things that makes someone either conservative or liberal is that some people are joiners and some people aren't. Yeah. And some people want to sort of fall in under a flag. And that is a, to me, a very conservative sort of like everybody has their rank in the hierarchy mindset and in a, to a large portion of the left. And I consider myself part of that portion. It's more about, no, we're all kind of in a coalition of, of people or of individuals that are sort of, pragmatically joining forces but we're not you know it's not a it, we're not on a team we're we're working together right. pragmatically right. Yeah, you I know like that. and so it makes it a little harder to what did you know. guys what did did you think that a a horrific nightmarish shooting at a fourth of july parade was as american as apple pie i mean it's the only place in the world the only civilized country well only probably only place that this kind of thing happens all the time this kid was a sniper in this case. I wonder at some point if even those rational amongst us are are not looking so irrational by saying, you know what, I just don't want to go out into a into a place where, you know, I could get picked off. I think that is happening. Is it I mean, I, mean, I wonder there is, there's a few grocery store, church around school. About New York. It's certainly yeah. it's certainly the case with school, with kids. I'm sorry, what were you saying? Um yeah, I was just saying that there's some articles rolling around in New York uh, about how people don't want to go out anymore. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, between that and COVID, you know, it's 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 definitely and, you know, the ability to work from home and, you know, and, you know, Zoom and stuff like that. It The the traction, the the idea of just being in a mass group of people is certainly probably at a uh, a low for in, over the last generation. You know, and, and to me, if there's any hope for actual real gun control, it's going to come because just economically, it's not feasible to let all these guns be out there, you know, because yeah. I, I, how does it get better without banning these? How does it get better? Because every time one of these happens, you're going to inspire 10 more. You know, I, I it, it's just at a certain point, you just you can't functionally run a country. And just without people constantly having to worry about getting picked off from a fucking rooftop, it's just not going to work. Do you think it's too harsh um, to say that if you have a tattoo on your face, that's a red flag? Like you can't no gun for you. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't care if it's a happy leaf or whatever it is. You can't have a gun. You have a tattoo uh, on your happy face. Leaf. <laughs> Is yeah. that your word for a marijuana leaf? I know. Leaf. I don't know. What, is that what he had? He had I, I feel like he had a leaf on his face. I don't know. He was the 
the most um, likely to kill innocent people looking face I've ever seen in my life. And I mean, I can make all the jokes I want. This guy had all kinds of red flags. Apparently, he wasn't even allowed to have a knife. But somehow he got an AR-15. Anyway, it's, I do think yeah. it's increasingly like my buddy in Australia, his wife is coming here for business for like 10 days and he's worried sick over about a shooting. I'm like, I mean, I don't want to tell him he's being around. This idea that people from foreign countries are worried about coming to America. This is part of the calculus now. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That, that it's part of the calculus is um, shocking, I guess. I don't know why someone from, say, Canada would ever get american citizenship at this point i mean it just seems like what? such a weird decision to make yeah i, agree I just with you. did that a year ago i, I'm, oh. I know i'm joking oh. that was i know but I, you know well the thing is is that uh right i know <laughs> why would i why every every single that's the one thing that um i was it made me mad this time that after after a Roe versus wade and then the shooting the amount of people who have reached out to me just in like their idle kind of way about like hey i i'm sure you're thinking about moving back it's i'm so sick of that being the conversation mm -hmm. of just like yeah so we should all just get like the old like if you don't like it move yeah like, because that's never gonna help anything love it or leave it it's like yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot and a lot of people will point out because, you know, my wife and I have certainly had those conversations, whatever, um, you know, and if, if I was one course. generation closer to my Irish relatives than my Irish heritage, then maybe I might consider it more strongly. But, you know, a lot of people say like, well, that's a very, you know, a lot of people that's not an option for and maybe the patriotic or, yeah. you know, the the yeah. brave thing to do is to stick it out and fight for the people that you care about rather than just pick up. And well, I mean, I think you should leave certain states. <laughs> sure. No, the sure. same thing applies. But the same thing applies. People are actually having a, an interesting debate about that. Like some intellectuals saying, listen, you've got to you got to get out of those places. And other people saying, we, no, we're going to fight. We're going to stay and we're going to fight. This is our homes where I, you know, I mean, well, and the I sad thing is, is that if all the all the liberals left those states, it would make things even worse because then those states would be completely dominated unless you're going to change the the makeup of the the senate then you know it makes it even worse it's i mean even, it just consolidates even, even power more even powerful harder. that's right yeah. uh yeah. mary trump puts it really perfectly in this tweet when she writes over 70 percent of americans support gun safety legislation marriage equality abortion rights government funding for child care paid maternity leave, raising the minimum wage, and more. This country isn't divided. A radical, armed, anti-democratic minority is attempting a hostile takeover. Christian? Uh, I think that's that's that may be true in the abstract, but I think that it's a bit mistaken in the sense that I think that why people vote is not necessarily as a checklist of the things they agree with or don't agree with. They, they well, respond so. to vibes. People like powerful people that people like winners and they don't like seeing people. They don't like dissembling weasels and they, mm -hmm. they see Republicans as like these guys are out there fucking doing something. They're kicking ass and they see or they see Democrats as just, you know, word salad, just mamby pamby, nothing political correctness, I, you know. I, I think, you know, you ask somebody, a lot of those people that I bet believe in all those things she just listed will still vote for a Ron DeSantis if given the option, <sighs> because there's just a vibe. There's just a vibe, man. I just want America. I just want like yeah. somebody to be in charge and to kind of make me feel like things are going to be good. You know, like just somebody just fucking be in control. Yeah. Everybody wants a benign dictator when it gets her down to it. It's just we have a different <laughs> definition of who that d big dictator is being benign towards. Well, and even if you, mm. I mean, mm. obviously you, we could all sit there and go like, yeah. And guess what? With all this stuff going down right now, who is the president? Is it a Republican? No. So, I mean, that's yeah. the other thing. My friend's like, how is this happening with Biden? And I was yeah. like, well, it's, super, it's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> it is a lot more complicated than that. But the, 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 pro, and I, you know, and I, I don't want to dogpile the dude, you know, and, and I, I, he did a lot of stuff in the first year of his term that I was very impressed by. And if you, by would the ask way, me, just, can I say, I love you saying about the president. I don't want to dogpile the dude. It's like, I like it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like very, you know, it's like your pal. Yeah. My, but he's my bro. He's my bro. He's my broski. And, uh, I don't want to raw dog him, but what? no, uh, 
<laughs> but, you know, the one thing, you know, the president has less power and more power than people think. Yeah. You know, they have less power legislatively, but they have more power in terms of steering the national conversation. And where I think Biden has completely fallen short, especially in the last six months, is he has completely lost the bully pulpit at all. And yeah. I know it's hard when things are so divided, but just energy. You see like an Elizabeth Warren get up in front of the microphone and she commands mm attention she commands it she speaks in the clear bright lines and she has a, a very she has actionable things that she's trying to that she wants to achieve and, and you're like god this is the energy that we need from the white house even if legislatively they couldn't do any of this stuff just that feeling of momentum like oh okay there, there's some person yeah. waving the flag being like this way follow me whereas totally. biden is what's he doing like where are we supposed to follow you dude like like show us what your intentions are don't just tell us, you know, you think Mitch McConnell's a really stand up guy. You, you know, like, I don't need that right now. Yeah. This whole, you know, the fucking thing he, he put out on Fourth of July where he's like, uh, America is an idea. And, Amer and it's like, OK, yeah, sure. America is a romantic notion, blah, blah, blah. You know what America also is? Americans, like actual human beings. And how about we sort of get rid of this sort of vague notion of what America is and fight for the actual and people who live in this country? Yeah. yeah. And, and I just so it's like this whole mamby pamby America's an idea like this, sorry dude read the room not the year right now yeah or at least you go America is an idea so here's my three ideas yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what we're gonna do yeah just do something even if the yeah. Supreme Court overturns it like I would way rather him just do something and have them mm -hmm. react to it than just yeah. constantly react yeah, there's, to everything uh, there's they do. A, definitely let's a, get some vertical lines on that flag <laughs> damn straight come on yeah well you this could, is like jonah on veep with his uh the daylight <laughs> savings thing you could also tell your friend who asked you know what would happen to america biden's president i mean what happened was the, definitely that donald trump because of our electoral college you know beat hillary clinton and appointed the re Supreme Court justices from the Hall mm -hmm. of Villains. And and so we could talk about the filibuster, but like what happened in the last few weeks of these Supreme Court decisions is a hundred percent because Opus Day is running the court. I mean, it's yeah. it's that's really more than anything else. Uh yeah. certainly Trump's and everything is so legacy. Li li too much power. Yeah. Where are you on women's reproductive rights being uh taken apart stripped stripped oh, yeah. uh where am i i mean ambivalent I, where do you fall down i just i do believe in that case you know this is not this is not what the people want this is i you know i do not believe the the from everything i've read this is not what america wants this is a very small amount of uh, Christian people who are not even Christian. They're all, they fucking pick and choose whatever yeah. the hell they want. Right. I, I just, I can never quite figure out who is stuffing the pockets here because that's what I think it all comes down to. Cause I, with the NRA and gun rights, I just go, yeah, I, like it's so hard to um, get past that when the NRA is just giving all of this stuffing these people's pockets. But it's more than just so the money. money. When, when it comes to that, it, it, I think it's more than yes, the money matters for their campaigns. But these guys would say and do these things without any of those donations, because in this case, guns and abortion are so animating that they would yes. be, they would say and do these extreme things after every shooting, even if they weren't getting paid with with campaign donations from the gun owners. I think it used to play a, a larger part. But now that rhetoric is everything and winning is everything. It's just uh, did you hear that so congresswoman say if I had to shoot my grandkids? Yeah, I haven't seen like <sighs> I can't I try to imagine what the context of that is, but I I don't want to find out. Yeah, so I uh, I do minutes. think so all of these Thank uh, you Representative uh, Jordan. I rise in opposition to HR 2377. I have 5 grandchildren. I would do anything, anything to protect my 5 grandchildren, including as a last resort shooting them if i had to <laughs> to protect the lives of my grandchildren what, what? um i don't want to go to protect them i don't want to go to mimi's house anymore does she mean shooting somebody else to protect her grandchildren like like i don't know who is them yeah, she misspoke it, she i misspoke? think it's gotta be it's gotta be yeah it's it, it, uh, the only that's too bad 
What if one of your grandkids was killing your other grandkids? The only thing you do is say, and that one is definitely, everybody knows he's an asshole. That's all I can come up with. Like, you know what? That's not going to be hard. This guy's always been problematic. He's hurting the, the, the defenseless poor kid. Got to save the herd. Got to save the herd. Well, it's not going to be that way. It's going to be the other way. The problematic one is the, historically the one that gets the gun. That get, that shoots the grandmother. General, that yeah. is generally the way it's played out. <laughs> yes. <that's... laughs> oh, we can laugh. Yeah. Oh, we can laugh. <laughs> So, yeah, do I think uh, Republican senators and all these uh, people who are all like, yeah, 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 no abortion, mad, you know, right to life, that their daughters, nieces, cousins, whatever, will all get their like nice little abortions uh, properly, safely taken care of after they have a fun time on prom night? Yeah, fun time on prom that's night. totally going to happen. Probably. Yeah. Uh- all right. Well, with all that given and said uh, here at the end, what is the best thing in your life? Any tiny thing, any show, any song, any moment, any piece of weather, a, uh, a propaganda win of some sort. Best thing in your life, Ophira. By the way, your video of you, if, if that's really you closing all the cupboards your husband opened, that was my favorite thing. I, it had to be exaggerated, though. It had to be. No yeah, way. I exaggerated a okay, little bit. Thank I exa- God. Just, just so you know, uh, listeners, just when I walk into the kitchen after my husband's been cooking and I will say he cooks a lot and yeah. that's a great benefit to me and my family. Uh, he just, every drawer and cupboard is open. It's like boggles my mind. So I'm always every day. I'm just coming into my kitchen, closing things. And at one point I was like, half of my life is just closing doors and, and shoving cupboards. What, what, what what's, anyways, isn't that like a that, woman always closing your cupboards? Never opening them, always closing them. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know that's Late and women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do have a little joke. It's like every time God closes a door, my husband will leave a cupboard <laughs> or drawer. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. So, uh, best thing in my life this week. Uh, this is uh, this is a kid thing. Why yeah. not? Yeah. So, my yeah. kid is going to summer camp. Uh, it's called uh, mindful sports, which they're supposed to do some breathing or something in between. And my husband, my husband is the kind of guy who uh, he does not care what anyone thinks about him in kind of an amazing way. So we, he said to me, we said to, so what, what's the mindful part? I know you guys are playing soccer and uh, basketball and Red Rover and all this, but what's the mindful part? And Lucas went, I don't know. Yeah. And we're like, well, are you breathing or doing some yoga? Or like, what? And he's like, I don't know. It doesn't seem anything. And so Jonathan's like, we're paying for mindfulness. So he wrote the camp. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, don't write the camp. That's ridiculous. He's like, oh, I'm writing. I want a discount if there's no mindfulness. <laughs> uh, he was joking about that. But he, yeah, he wrote them that there was not enough mindfulness. I was like, you know, they are printing out that ridiculous email and putting it on their bulletin that board. That is of awesome. Like, the craziest I want to see that, that not enough mindfulness just but by the way he, he's basing it on your six-year-old's interpretation like, interpret- like it's, it's, yeah like he doesn't know it but it's there they're doing they must be it's doing in there it's in you know it's 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 like eggs and in then, a cake. they're in there yeah and then at the end of the week I guess they all gave them awards for that week at camp most mindful football cer- player he got Lucas he, I go oh you got a certificate what's it for he goes most mindful i was like oh, oh they figured out our number <laughs> that is <laughs> that awesome. was just purely a fuck you to jonathan <laughs> yeah, like you know it was, was. Totally it was just like no, no, i got it i got it let's give the his kid most mindful oh uh, that's that awesome that, that, that is the whole thing made me laugh so sweet hard revenge because i just felt like every once in a while you just have to um enjoy how ridiculous we can all be mm-hmm. uh Christian, that's great. Ophir, I love it. Uh, I don't have best thing? Quite what do you, what do you got? Uh, um, well, uh, I got together with some friends over the weekend, which was nice. Uh, my friends, Bob Powers and Amanda Melson, we were up in the, up in the woods and uh, we, we had a grand old time uh, drinking outside and just uh, enjoying the nice weekend. And uh, on, a, on a, just a pop culture level, um, I watched the pilot for The Old Man starring Jeff Bridges and it's super awesome. If you haven't Ooh. watched it, it's uh, on FX and Hulu. Uh, we haven't watched any other episodes yet, but the pilot is maybe the best pilot I've seen wow. in a long time. I've heard that from like 10 different people about wow. this show. Wow, okay. It's really good. So I hate go. this when I hear so much about a show and then I watch it and I don't love it and I feel like I'm just, it's me. Like there's something wrong with me. 
Why can't no, I enjoy I this? Because I, I felt the same way. Like I'd heard a lot of people say it too. Uh, it's great. Well, it's enjoyable. All right. Well, what I'm about you, Pete? Uh, nothing. There's nothing good. Mm -hmm. The uh, I have a mustache. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My pool is being uh, filled up with water finally here in mid uh, in mid July. Above. That's ground pool. amazing. My above grounder yeah. is filling up. Yeah. If you work hard enough, you get there. It's like there a mindfulness dream. award. But as long as nobody brings something <laughs> sharp in the pool and it pops and deflates, oh, they be, will. That would be terrible. Oh, they will. Wait a second. What's the point of going in a pool without a knife? <laughs> Good point. Good point. Uh, you guys Marco are awesome. I'm so glad to have you back together. Thank you very much. Have an awesome weekend, and I will see you both uh, next week in Wednesday. New Jersey, Wednesday the 13th. It's gonna be awesome. Indeed. All right. Bye. Down, Jersey. All right. Yeah, and that is it. We are done. Oh, I don't want to be done. I appreciate you listening so much. Thanks. Big thanks to Tamar Haspel, who was so great. Can't wait to get her on again. And as always, Christian Finnegan, Opira Eisenberg. So good. See all three of us this ja this uh, July, almost January, July 13th, this Wednesday, in southern New Jersey, Ventor City, New Jersey, where I've never been and uh, really looking forward to that. Hope to see some of you there. And I hope you have an awesome weekend. I so thank you for listening and even more for subscribing. If you haven't, please sign up now. Need the subscriptions. As always, as little as five bucks a month or more. You can always pay more. Five shows a week. Almost always two guests a show. And cranking it out, learning together, growing together with you each and every day. Let me know who you want to hear on the show. Let me know if you want to be on the show, and we will talk. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com, at Pete Dominic. And have a great weekend, everybody. Love you guys. Thank you very much for listening, for your support. Tell your friends. Give a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And that's it. I'm done. John Carroll, take over, please. Sing us out. Open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the seat of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be told up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up got to stand